Shalom and welcome. And thank you for joining us this evening. To all Holy Blossom Temple congregants, to our clergy, and of course, initiative and the women of wholesome we want to thank you for taking the time to join us for this evening's exciting and most enlightening webinar tonight we will look at the ups and downs of bringing baby home real talk for new parents about perinatal mental health issues our guest speaker dr ariel dolphin will have much uh, much wonderful information to offer all of you who are listening tonight i would like to now welcome Rabbi Zachary Goodman to say a few words. Rabbi Goodman is Holy Blossom Temple's cherished associate rabbi, who is also a member of the Luke Sklar Mental Health Initiative. He and his wife also were first time parents just a little over one year ago. And good evening, Rabbi. Hello, Pam, welcome to everyone. As you said, I'm Rabbi Goodman, uh, the assistant rabbi here at Holy Blossom Temple. Uh, first and foremost, I want to extend my, my gratitude to everyone uh, joining us online this evening or watching uh, the recording at a later date and engaging with this important topic. Whether you are personally managing your mental health after bringing a new little one home, uh, you're loving someone who just had a new kiddo or simply are interested in learning more about this topic, we are grateful to you for being present. We know there are many things that are happening online these days, and so uh, we appreciate your presence. A special word of gratitude to Holy Blossom congregant, Dr. Ariel Delfin, for being so generous of her time and giving us the opportunity to learn from her expertise. So we'll introduce Dr. Delfin to you formally in a few moments, but on behalf of the Luke Sklar Mental Health Initiative and the Women of Holy Blossom, I want to extend our gratitude to you. Uh, while we are gathering online this evening, we acknowledge that Holy Blossom Temple operates on land that is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and Wendat peoples. This land is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Meti people. The land on which Holy Blossom stands is covered by Treaty 13, signed with the Mississaugas of the Credit, and the Williams Treaty signed with multiple Mississaugas and Chippewa bands. And we uh, express our gratitude. We are grateful that we have the privilege of stewardship and can practice our faith and our good learning on this good land. And so perhaps another word of gratitude. We're sensing a theme, uh, Pam. Mm -hmm. <laughs> another word of gratitude to the two working groups who made this possible, the Woman of Holy Blossom, formerly known as the Sisterhood, uh, is a safe space for female identifying Jews comprised of advocates uh, for the interests of women in our congregation and allies for marginalized communities. We thank you for your hard work to make this evening a success, this joint program of the Women of Holy Blossom and Luke Squad Mental Health Initiative. If you have questions, you can connect with Corinne Black, the president of this wonderful group, as well as Hannah Eisenberg, who uh, we'll be seeing a little later in the question and answer section of this evening. As well as a big thank you to the members of the Luke Sklar Mental Health Initiative. Um, our mission is to provide education, support, and resources related to the challenges of living with or supporting someone with a mental illness. And we believe that by talking about and supporting mental health, this initiative will work toward ending stigma around mental illness and encourage others to seek help. And so in the spirit of mental health, we recognize that conversations surrounding this topic can be triggering. And so we are grateful to Jewish Family and Child Services for providing social workers who are present with us tonight. So if at any point during the evening or following the event, you feel the need to speak with a professional, you can connect with Sharon Feldman or Sarah Goodman. That's Sharon Feldman or Sarah Goodman, and I'm just going to copy their um, contact information and share in the chat now. You can reach them at sfeldman at jfncs.com or sgoodman at jfncs.com. 
And I didn't share that with everyone. So here we are once again. Their emails are in the chat box. Just a last word of housekeeping before we really begin. We expect to be together this evening for about an hour and 15 minutes, and we'll conclude with a question and answer period moderated by a woman of Holy Blossom member, Hannah Eisenberg. So for those of us who are here in real time, at the bottom of your screens, you will see a Q&A button. Uh, we encourage you to use this function to pose questions to Dr. Delphin at any time during the webinar and we will attempt to answer as many as we can during the Q&A. So please note that if you would like to submit your question anonymously, you can click the checkbox when you submit your question and your identity will be kept entirely confidential. So I think that's it for me. Um, Pam, I'm gonna turn it back over to you. Okay. Again, thank you for being here, everyone. Thank you, Rabbi Goodman. And uh, please join me now in welcoming Dr. Ariel Dolphin. Dr. Dolphin completed her undergraduate degree at Princeton University in public policy and international relations. She attended McMaster University Medical School and then completed her specialty in psychiatry at the University of Toronto. Dr. Dolphin is a psychiatrist at Mount Sinai Hospital where she was the head of the perinatal mental health program for 12 years until early 2021. She is also the head of the Perinatal Mental Health Telemedicine Program at Sinai, an innovative and first of its kind program that provides specialized mental health care to women around the province of Ontario using mobile health technologies. She continues to focus her research on developing virtual care innovations in women's mental health. Dr. Dalpin's book, which I will show you later, When Baby Brings the Blues, is widely used by both healthcare providers and the general public. Please join me now in welcoming Dr. Ariel Dalpin. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pam. I'm just going to share my screen. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, Okay. Oops. There we go. Can you see that, Pam? Is that? Yes, I can see okay. that. Terrific. Terrific. Um, thank you so much, Pam. And thank you so much, Rabbi Goodman, for inviting me here tonight. It is an absolute honor and, and joy for me to be invited here at my own congregation to speak. I, I take that as a, as a, as a real honor and um, I'm proud to be part of Holy Blossom where Pam, my daughter attended nursery school many, many, many years ago. And I'm not sure if Rabbi Goodman remembers that uh, my same daughter lives one of the first kids to have her bat mitzvah over Zoom in the very early days of the pandemic a couple of years ago. So thanks to you both and, um, and thank you to everybody for joining us here tonight when um, I know there are a lot of competing demands on your time and many of you have probably been on your screens all day. So uh, thank you, thank you for your time and I hope that this will be useful and interesting, and I'm excited to hear what you have to say and answer any questions that people have. Um, I, I thank in particular the Luke Scar Mental Health Initiative, which I think is a fabulous and uh, innovative and very important initiative at Holy Blossom, um, as well as the women of Holy Blossom for uh, sponsoring and for having me here today to talk about this topic that is obviously near and dear to my heart and near and dear to every aspect of my, my life day in and day out, um, because as um, as Pam mentioned before, I've been practicing as a perinatal psychiatrist for about 20 years now. And um, so I spend much of my time talking with new moms and new dads and families about what it's like to be a new parent, uh, how to deal with mental health challenges when planning pregnancy, when pregnant and postpartum. And I hope that I can share some thoughts with you tonight. Um, and so what I wanna talk about tonight are a few things, sort of laying the groundwork about really what perinatal mental, issue, mental health issues are, why they're important, and an understanding and appreciation of their widespread impact. 
I want to talk a little bit about what some of the causes are and how we understand them and how you and your family members can understand if you're at risk or if your family members at risk, and then broadly talk about some treatments. I am aware that um, during these days of COVID that we've all been living under for almost two years now, a, a lot of the issues that I'm going to talk about uh, have been intensified and have been magnified and becoming a new parent during the time of COVID has, um, has brought its very, very large challenges to many new families and many new parents um, and have really increased a lot of the things that we've seen in the past in terms of perinatal mental health issues. And I'm gonna focus on that and talk a little bit about that later on, but really wanna lay the groundwork about what some of the commonalities and concerns may be. So just starting out with um, a bit of a sense of definition and overview, um, I, want to, I want to share our working definition as mental health care providers. So we use a book called the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, the DSM for short, and currently the fifth uh, edition is what we used. And, and this fifth edition has made some progress in terms of understanding perinatal mental health issues, because for the first time, it's this, um, this sort of Bible of healthcare diagnoses acknowledged that depression in particular can start during pregnancy, hence the peripartum and not just the postpartum, peri meaning all around the perinatal period. So the, the actual definition that we use to make a diagnosis is that depression could start both during pregnancy as well as up to four weeks postpartum. We still, those of us in this field still argue that um, this is quite a, quite a limited definition still because it only talks about depression. And as I'll talk about tonight, there are other mental health issues that are very, very common, but it's, it's progress in really understanding that we need to look further than just the day the baby's born and postpartum. We need to start thinking about this in pregnancy. And many of us even argue that the best time to see someone is before they're even planning pregnancy, if they have a mental health risk or if they have a strong family history or personal history. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that later. So we know that up to a third of episodes of uh, postpartum depression, actually, it's a bit of a misnomer and they begin during pregnancy. And as I said, they can still begin up to a year postpartum. Oops, sorry about that. Um, so, um, hold on, sorry about this. So the numbers I'm gonna share here are to really give you a sense of how widespread these issues are. So we know that between 10 and 20% of pregnant people and new mothers um, are impacted by postpartum depression in particular. Postpartum anxiety disorders are probably around the same, around the same percentages. And so if we think about that in terms of the Canadian population, there are about 360,000 uh, live births per year. So 10% of that is a very high number of the population. So many, many people are impacted. And we also know that this is probably an underestimate because this number captures the people that actually come forward for help, the people that reach out for help and that actually get a diagnosis. It doesn't account for all the people who are suffering at home silently, who feel a lot of internalized stigma or social stigma and or who don't, or who reach out and are, are turned away for help. So we think that this number is, is probably an underestimate of the range. The course of the illness too, it can, it, can, it can last for a very long time. There are those with perinatal mental health issues who have a self-limited course of their illness, meaning it will peter out on its own. So sometimes after someone just starts to get into the swing of things or figures things out as a new parent, a lot of their symptoms and their actual illness can, can recede into the background. That's not everybody, and that's by far not most people. Um, about 30% of people, unfortunately, remain sick after a year postpartum. And we know that up to 40% of people who are struggling can also have relapses. So relapses either at another perinatal period during pregnancy or postpartum, 
or sometimes at other stages in life. And that's sometimes less likely. We also know that one of the most concerning but not infrequent outcomes of perinatal mental health issues, particularly when they are untreated, particularly when they're long lasting and severe, um, that suicide does occur. And the highest risk time for that, as you can see on this slide, when 60% of suicides occur, is in about the six weeks before delivery and in the first three months or the first 12 weeks um, postpartum. So there is a, a quite a big burden of illness, as we say, on many people and potentially for a long period of time when they're at a key moment in their lives of raising children, trying to adjust to a new life, trying to take on a new role. And so these, these issues can be very, very significant. Um, sorry about this. I don't know. Okay. Um, I'm having a little issue. We also know that there's a ripple effect. There is a ripple effect of perinatal and mental health issues in terms of who is impacted. We know that the woman herself, and I'm gonna talk about some of the symptoms that we'll see, but we also know that partners are impacted. We know there's increased rates of depression and other mental health issues among partners of uh, people who are suffering. We know that the risk is also transmitted down through generations, so that babies have what we call insecure attachment to their parent. And the, the impact of that insecure attachment is that babies go on to develop possibly their own mental health issues as they grow up. When they are trying to connect with a parent who's not available or who is absent or who can't smile back at them and interact with them, that can be very, very hard on a baby's psychosocial development and can lead to issues down the road for the baby. Also, if a baby's not getting the stimulation it needs because a parent is quite impaired by a mental health issue, research has shown that there are poor cognitive and social factors um, and adjustment issues that happen among children. And I want to be really careful in talking to you about these impacts, especially the latter two, because so often I see women and they come to me and they say, you know what, I'm struggling with depression or I'm struggling with anxiety and I'm really, really nervous. What's this going to mean to my child? Have I already ruined my child's life? Are they going to be set up for, sort of for failure or for mental illness? And I want to be really clear that these results of the research are from people who've had severe, long-standing and untreated perinatal mental health issues. That's when we see the effects. So what I want to, I'm going to convey tonight and going to say over and over again is how we can reduce these impacts both on our partners and on the next generation uh, if we can identify what's happening, if we can recognize it and understand it and reach out for help these impacts will be mitigated significantly. So I'm gonna move on to talk about some of the stigma that we see, and I'm just calling it false news because just wanting to change up a little bit of the language, because so often, one of the first things I have to do when I'm seeing a new patient is really do some destigmatizing work around what people are struggling with. Um, and so a lot of the times people will come to me and they'll say, you know what, I haven't been feeling well for three months. I can hardly get out of bed. I can't care for my baby alone. I've gone to see my physician or my primary care provider, or I've told my, you know, my spouse or my in-laws or my friends, and everyone says it's just really, really hard. And this is totally normal. So I'm here to say tonight that it is not normal to struggle a lot. It is not normal to have an ongoing impairment in functioning. It is not normal to feel like you can't get out of bed and you can't function and you can't care for yourself for a baby. Of course, we all have ups and downs in our lives and as parents, but it is not normal to struggle intensely on an ongoing basis, either during pregnancy or postpartum. And that's really important to understand. Also, people come in and they're very, very terrified that they have um, postpartum mental health issues. And they're some of the primary worries um, because sometimes in the media, we hear these stories of people who've you know, jumped onto the subway tracks with their baby in their arms, or they've, um, or something really terrible is gonna happen to them, or their baby's gonna be taken away. And there's so much sensationalized 
news and stories. And people are worried that they're gonna go from struggling with a few symptoms all the way to those most severe, very, very scary cases. And again, that doesn't happen. Often it is a very slow buildup of symptoms and it is a very, um, if people are aware and they can talk to people and they know where to get help, um, we can really go a long way towards intervening early. And these outcomes are extremely, extremely rare and extremely unusual. Unfortunately, they're what we hear and what we think about, but they're very unusual. The other idea that a lot of people have is that um, if you're strong enough, if you can just pull yourself up by your bootstraps, you'll get through this. Just the whole mind over matter, you can do this. Like just put your nose down to the grindstone, work through it. Everybody goes through this, you can do it too. And again, I have to tell people, it's not about strength. It's not about your the quality of your personality. It's not about the strength of your personality or the strength of your of your of your wherewithal. Mental illness is stronger than our personalities. Mental illness is stronger than us much of the time. And it's not about strength or willing it away. It's about getting help for an actual illness that's affecting our bodies and our minds and our emotions and our brains. The other thing that people worry about too, and that they hear about all the time is that it's, and it's very, very common for women. And again, tonight, I'm gonna asterisk this, that I'm, I'm using the word women and new mom, um, but I am, cause that is the vast, vast, vast majority of the people who we see. And, um, but this is meant to be for anybody who identifies or anybody who, who is a parent, um, I hope that, you can feel comfortable and I hope that you can um, I, I identify with the terms um, tonight. But, but so often there's this idea that it's the mom's fault. So uh, a, a mom will often tell herself, um, oh, you know, if, if I didn't, you know, move to this city while I was pregnant or postpartum, or if I didn't do this, or if I should have done that, then, you know, and it's all my fault, or, or people will say, you know, my partner keeps telling me I shouldn't do this, or I shouldn't do that. And people come in carrying a very high load and a very high burden on their own shoulders, um, that it is their fault that they are struggling. And again, this is an illness, it couldn't be further from the truth. And it couldn't end, and it's really important to work against that stigma so people have that sense that they're not a bad person, that they're not, there's nothing wrong with them for struggling. And then finally, what we hear so often from people is that they've really delayed coming in for help and or they're or they've avoided it because either they've been told by someone else, maybe another healthcare provider, maybe someone in their family or friends that don't even bother going to reach out for help because no treatments are really safe. Therapy eh, doesn't really work or people will come in so often and say, I don't believe in therapy or my partner doesn't believe in therapy. So I'm not really going to bother doing it. And also people say, you know, I know that I can't take any medication, so I'm just going to go on struggling. Neither one of those is true. Um, there are a lot of therapies that are evidence-based that have been shown to be very helpful for many mental health issues. And in particular, there are therapies that have been shown to be helpful for perinatal mental health issues. And there are many medications that are fine to take during pregnancy, that are fine to take if someone is nursing, and that are very safe, and that they're often, frankly, very important part of a treatment plan. So I so I, I think it's all important for all of us to be on the same page and understanding some of the falsehoods that, that many people carry around about these, these mental health issues. Because really the truth, as I've said before, and I will keep repeating it, is that perinatal mental health issues, they're very common. They're medical issues that affect our brains and our bodies and our emotions. They can be prevented in many cases and they can be treated in many, many cases. So I think it's important to be hopeful and to be positive. And none of that is just based on, on me coming up with ideas on my own, but based on data and based on the medical literature that we are aware of. So, you know, when we talk about treatment and we talk about um, what the goals of treatment are and we talk about um, what, what we're looking for and what's normal versus not, 
I, I, I also spend a lot of time talking to people that we're not going for perfection. And there is no such thing as the perfect parent. And there is no such thing as a parent who is going to be thrilled and happy about being a parent each and every day. And that is not a goal of treatment. And that's another thing that people hold on to and really, really struggle with. And so I'm sharing this quote because I think it really reflects the hugely mixed bag that is parenting. Um, and it says that a good mom has bad days and great days and normal days and overwhelming days and perfect days and trying days and super mom days and just being a mom days and a whole lot of love and real crazy motherhood days. So this is a message I often tell people because their expectations of themselves when they become a parent are that every day is gonna be wonderful and blissful and they'll be thrilled to be in this role and they'll be you know, super, super happy all the time. And, and that's not true. And just because that isn't true doesn't mean you have a mental illness. And, it, and also it's a realistic goal for all of us to incorporate into our minds when we're looking at parenting as human beings with the ups and downs of life. So I'm going to shift gears a little bit right now and talk about um, postpartum mood disorders and some of the symptoms. So they were all talking about the same things. First off, um, we have what we call baby blues and baby blues happens to about 50 to 80 percent of new moms. Um, I'm going to talk about the, the symptoms in a minute, but as you can see in the, the smaller bubble, we then have postpartum depression, which I mentioned I'm going to talk about next. It happens to about 10 to 20 percent of new parents. And then the very, very rare, and this is what people get in their mind as the sensationalized and very scary outcomes usually, is where we have postpartum psychosis. It happens to about one in a thousand new moms, and it is a medical emergency. I'm not going to talk about it tonight, but those are the cases that often make it to the news where we hear women saying that they have heard voices that they need to um, they need to harm their children or drown their children and these are the stories that we hear in the news these are the most extreme rare and most serious cases but as i will emphasize extremely extremely rare um, I want to first start to talk about baby blues because baby blues is very, very common. As you saw, the number I just put up of 50 to 80 percent of new parents um, experience baby blues. And we don't even actually consider it to be a disorder or a psychiatric illness, so to speak. But it's really important to understand it because it is so widespread. And in particular, for people who've had a history of mental health problems, it's important that we start paying close attention at this time. It can start within days of delivery, immediately after delivery. It actually peaks on day five postpartum, and that coincides with when um, a new mom's milk comes in. So our understanding is that it has to do with a lot of dramatic hormone shifts that are going on. But by two weeks postpartum, by two to three weeks postpartum, we should see it going away. A lot of the things we see when people present with baby blues are feeling really tearful, irritable, very overwhelmed. Um, people, you know, commonly say, how did I get myself into this situation as a mom? How can I get myself out of this situation as a mom? They're feeling freaked out. They're feeling overwhelmed. And, you know, their life is just and their bodies and everything is in major upheaval. And it's really a very tumultuous time. And. If we don't have specific treatments for it, but when we hear that someone's struggling with it, we see women in this phase, we reassure them, we educate them about what's happening to their bodies, to their lives. We offer them education about what to look out for. And we really emphasize getting support, working on your support network. Who can help you with um, while, while the baby naps? Who can bring you food? Who can help you with your laundry? Who can help you with other things that you don't absolutely need to do? Who's there for you to talk to? And really helping people build up a support network and, and, and hoping that over the next few weeks as, as things adjust and stabilize, that it will resolve. If it doesn't resolve, we get into the next phase, which is postpartum depression. And after about the two to three mark, and if symptoms are quite severe, we, we, we then start to think that someone is maybe experiencing a depression. 
And, and depression in the postpartum period can look off an awful lot like depression at other times. So the main symptoms of depression being uh, a depressed mood, uh, tearfulness, having trouble enjoying oneself, but very prominently postpartum, there's a flavor of intense feelings of guilt. So mom's feelings like, I shouldn't have eaten this because it's gonna come into the breast milk and it's gonna hurt my baby, or I didn't dress the baby up properly, or I'm not stimulating the baby enough, or I'm not doing this right, I'm not doing that right. Intense feelings of guilt and worthlessness are very prominent. A lot of anxiety also comes with postpartum depression. I'm gonna talk about specific anxiety disorders after, but it's often a very mixed bag between postpartum depression and anxiety. Um, sleep is a very sensitive symptom of postpartum depression because um, if most many new moms who aren't struggling can sleep at the drop of a hat because they're absolutely exhausted. If someone tells me, you know what, I just can't settle my mind, I can't stop my thoughts, I can't calm down and I can't settle down, that's a red flag because that anxiety agitation is leading to insomnia. So people have trouble relaxing and settling down. Also, commonly people will feel really edgy and irritable and very, very angry. And um, I say this a little bit tongue in cheek, but it's also very true that the, main, the two main targets I'd say of most patients' irritability and anger are their partners, their spouses, and their mother-in-laws. Um, and so people often feel intense irritability and anger that's uncharacteristic for them and out, out of keeping with their normal personality. And also obvious intense feelings of feeling overwhelmed, like they can't get through the day, they can't get things done that they need to do. Um, and, and so those are generally the sense and the symptoms that people have with postpartum depression. When we get into the more severe or sometimes even more moderate severe um, uh, episodes of postpartum depression, people start to express suicidal thoughts, thoughts about wanting to harm themselves, thoughts that I just can't go on like this. And that's when things start to uh, become in a little bit more serious mode and in a crisis mode. And we have to figure out a crisis plan immediately to help ensure the safety of the, of the new mom, the new, the new parent. And then also in, in more severe cases, people may have thoughts of wanting to harm or wanting to kill their baby. And I know these are very disarming and jarring for some people to hear, and it's extremely unpleasant for people to feel, but I think it's really important to say these words and to talk about these words, because so often when new moms in particular have these thoughts, they're terrified. They're absolutely terrified that something terrible is going to happen to them, that their baby's going to be taken away from them. And I, I, I want people to know that that's that the when you have these thoughts, when people start to have these thoughts, it's a sign to reach out for help. It's a sign to get help and it's a sign to speak up because healthcare providers and healthcare practitioners look very favorably on someone who's realizing that she's struggling and reaching out for getting help. And, and important to, to, uh, to talk about this and important to, to reach out when these symptoms are emerging or if you hear of someone you love or someone you know is having these, these uh, suicidal or infanticidal thoughts. I also wanna talk a little bit about some of the common perinatal anxiety disorders because we give a lot of airtime to postpartum depression and depression in pregnancy. Um, but Anxiety disorders are very, very common as well. I put the uh, most common ones up here and I'll just give you a little bit of a flavor of what each of them looks like and sounds like um, so that you can have a sense. The first two are uh, generalized anxiety disorder and panic disorder. These are still, this is kind of nerdy psychiatry stuff, but the first two are still characterized formally as anxiety disorders. 
obsessive compulsive disorder is characterized not as an anxiety disorder anymore and neither is post-traumatic stress disorder, but they, they have prominent symptoms of anxiety. So for the purposes of tonight, I'm gonna include them in, in the anxiety category because they're also all not uncommon. So when someone has generalized anxiety disorder, what that looks like is basically nonstop worrying around the clock about everyday types of things. So worrying about, um, did the baby eat enough? Do I have enough milk? Is the baby warm enough? Um, am I, you know, is the baby going to get into the right daycare? Do the you know, this, that, and the other, you name it, all, everyday worries that all of us might have and all of us as new parents might have sort of popping in and out of our heads become larger than life and take over someone's thinking and feeling and become very, very preoccupying. Plus, um, they are also accompanied by a lot of physical symptoms. So um, physical symptoms of like a clenched jaw or a racing heart or feelings of shortness of breath or, you know, a knot in the stomach. So the combination of these ongoing worries and the physical manifestations of worries would give someone this type of, um, of a diagnosis. Panic disorder looks um, a bit different. Panic disorder is also not uncommon among, among new moms and it's characterized by um, discrete, what we call panic attacks. And I know that word gets thrown around a lot, but when we talk about panic attacks, what we mean is basically like a fight or flight feeling in your body. So like, and people would also call it like an adrenaline rush. So your heart's racing. You might have numbness and tingling in your hands. You might feel short of breath or chest pain. People often have the idea that they're going crazy or they're gonna die because of this feeling. It can come on suddenly out of the blue and it can last for maybe about 20 minutes. And, you know, sometimes, people have these as one-off events and that wouldn't be considered a panic disorder. What we see when a, when a new mom has a panic disorder is that she may have these recurrently. So she'll have a few episodes of a panic disorder. Then she, what she will do is start worrying about more panic disorders coming. And then she will start avoiding certain situations. She'll say, oh, you know what? Last time I had one when I was taking the baby for a walk. So I'm not gonna go out for a walk. I'm not gonna take the baby out. Or last time I had one when I was giving the baby a bath. So I'm not gonna give the baby back and it breeds a great deal of avoidance which then creates a lot of problems and very limiting to the new mom herself often she fears like she can't take care of the baby on her own because she may become incapacitated and be unable to take care of her child so again it it sounds quite dramatic and it can be quite dramatic to experience but it's not but it does happen and um important to know about Obsessive compulsive disorder is also common postpartum, and it is often characterized by intrusive and unwanted thoughts. Often thoughts will pop into a new mom's head about scary things, scary visions of harm coming to the baby or of them inadvertently harming the baby. Again, often new parents will have these sort of flashes of unpleasant thoughts come in their head and pop out of their head. When those thoughts keep coming one after the other and they don't go away, that's when we're in the disorder category. Again, this is very disconcerting to a new mom to experience this, but we wanna reassure people, these are not the people that actually do harm to their babies. These people have a, a type of anxiety disorder and a treatable illness, it's treatable by therapy, treatable by medication, and um, very important to get help for. And then finally, I just want to uh, I just want to highlight post traumatic stress disorder because it too can occur in the postpartum period or during pregnancy, um, for in particular to people who've had a previous traumatic event in their lives, um, a pre or been in a previous abusive situation or have been assaulted somehow, because pregnancy and the postpartum period is such a uh, physically dramatic and, you know, time where people feel very exposed in many ways, whether it's through labor and delivery or breastfeeding, it, it can, it can either re-trigger or, or, or be traumatizing to, to people. 
So that's all I'm going to say about that because um, I'm going to keep on um, keep on talking because I want to start to talk a little bit about what some of the causes are and some of the treatments that we have. So I know this looks like a very busy slide, but I think it's a great slide that illustrates how we think about a mental health problem at any given time in a person's life. So as psychiatrists and mental health care providers, we often rely on what's called the biopsychosocial model. So we look at all the biological factors that are at play in a person's life, whether that's their genetics, whether that's other underlying medical issues, whether that is other medications they may be on. In the postpartum period, that might be intense lack of sleep and what that does to our bodies. It might be really low levels of iron or it might be thyroid abnormalities. So we really want to think about all these biological factors. We also want to combine them with the person's um, psychology and how the person sees the world and how the person looks at the world and what their coping skills are and what their mindset is. And then we wanna look at what their social environment is. What is, their, who, what is their family life like? What is their work life like? Do they have work? What is their socioeconomic status? And we combined all these different factors and potential stressors that are at play in a person's life, in, a, in their body, in their world. And then we come up with an understanding and a, and a sense of what the person's risk is and why this person is coming to see us today with this issue. So. As all of you can imagine, all of us are, you know, creatures of physical creatures with a body, with relationships, with personalities. And, and so these can be very complicated things to unwind, but we want to be able to understand all these factors in order to understand what the causes are and also to understand how we can really help someone feel better. So I think it's important to have a sense of what the major risk factors are for people with perinatal mental illness and apply some of those um, biological and psychological and social factors. So we know that people who have a history of, in particular, perinatal mental illness, both during pregnancy and in the postpartum period, are going to be at the highest risk of relapse. So these really biological factors in terms of family history and brain, um, brain chemistry and brain structure um, play a very, very big role for people. We also see, in particular here, you'll see that I've written out premenstrual problems. So we, we know that there's a link between people who've had what we call either premenstrual syndrome or premenstrual dysphoric disorder and problems when they're pregnant or postpartum because there are people who are just much more sensitive than other people to hormonal fluctuations in terms of developing um, mental health symptoms when their brains are under hormonal fluctuations. If we think back to the psychological bucket or circle that I had on the previous slide, we also know one of the major factors is someone who has a per per perfectionistic personality. So those of you, those of you who have kids can probably appreciate that, you know, if someone is used to getting things done in a certain way, being super organized, just functioning by, you know, being organized, writing all these lists, getting things done, going through the day in a structured way. When you bring a baby home and you're used to functioning that way and feeling good when you can function that way, it's a perfect storm because a newborn doesn't know about your lists or about your schedules. And this can be very disconcerting to people. It's also a risk for people who are younger. And, you know, when we think about the other social bucket, people who are in difficult relationships and often with younger age, it is, it is relationship issues and other psychosocial uh, stressors as well that people have. And then, of course, some of the other factors are issues related to a pregnancy. So you can imagine if someone either has an unwanted pregnancy or a very traumatic time during pregnancy or medical complications, or if they're dealing with a child who has medical issues or is very colicky or has nursing or feeding challenges, this can make the perinatal time very, very challenging. 
And then of course, um, people who have very limited social supports, um, that's a major risk factor for people. And of course, people who are living through very stressful life events at the time of their pregnancy or postpartum period. So of course, no meeting today or any conversation today can go without talking about COVID. So um, I, I, I wanna highlight here this excellent quote that I found, you know, when we're thinking about the impact of, of COVID, um, the way this author, um, Dr. Osborne put it, I think really captures a lot of what we've been seeing lately and speaks to the major, major life stress of living under a pandemic. And she writes, for healthy women, pandemic circumstances can be overwhelming and may lead to new symptoms of anxiety. For the one in five women who suffer from perinatal mood and anxiety disorders, they may be crippling. So we're seeing a lot of this and I want to acknowledge this for the new parents or people who are pregnant in the audience today that what you are going through now with the living under pandemic circumstances is making this whole experience so much harder and um, much, much more challenging. And I wish I had another hour to talk about what all the what all the challenges are, but I'm, I just want to really acknowledge how how challenging having a baby is at the best of times, struggling with a mental health problem is at the best of times, coping with a pandemic is, and then when you put all of that together, it's it's a really really hard time for many people. Um, and I, I think it's important to think that even though we can't prevent the pandemic, we can we can prevent other pieces of the perinatal mental health journey and of people developing perinatal mental illness. And there are different levels of prevention. So um, I'm not gonna get into all the epidemiology of the different levels of prevention, but the way I look at prevention now is really um, preventing in people who are at risk. Um, and, and that's really important. So if you think about what maybe your risk factors are, risk factors are for people who you love, we can intervene early and we can start the conversation early. So improving our understanding about what perinatal mental issues are and what they're not and reducing some of the stigma and some of the fake news that's out there about, that's out and about that we hear so much about to reduce in the people in our world or in general the shame around mental illness in general and around perinatal mental health issues as well as a lot of the guilt that people feel when they're str they're struggling and and also intervening as early as we possibly can when we talk about treatment um i think it's really important to intervene as early as possible so you know, I've been at this uh, at this profession for, as I said, about 20 years now, and we used to see people for the first time postpartum, maybe six weeks postpartum commonly after they went to see their OB and they told their OB, their obstetrician, or usually it was then, that they were struggling and we would see them postpartum. Then it started to creep up that we would see them during pregnancy because we did a lot of education, a lot of talks with, with the, our referring physicians about how the earlier the better and the earlier we can see them the better and now we see people when they're planning pregnancy as I mentioned before if someone's at risk or if they have had a history of mental health issues or previous episodes the earlier we see them the better so I encourage people talk to your healthcare providers um, get help identify and treat any underlying medical issues at, or as, as soon as possible the most common ones we see postpartum that often present like mental health issues are low iron and uh, thyroid disorders. So really common to try and get on top of that as quickly as possible to remove, to, to, do, to um, use any kind of treatments that are available for those and sleep. Um, if I had another hour, I would also talk about sleep. All my patients think I'm a bit of a broken record talking about sleep, but sleep is one of the most powerful tools for helping um, postpartum disorders in particular, for helping any mental disorders generally. Very, very important to understand sleep, sleep issues, sleep barriers, and, and address that. Um, I'm going to, I'm not going to focus a ton on social interactions other than to, for people to think about how to boost their own 
uh, support network. Unfortunately, these days during COVID, a lot of the community social supports that people relied on and that were so valuable are uh, not as readily available if they're available at all. Um, but really important for people to develop a uh, support network. All the medical data shows how important and how key this social intervention is for, for treatment. Then again, uh, psychological treatment. So there are certain um, individual talk therapies such as cognitive behavioral therapy and interpersonal therapy, which has been studied in particular in the perinatal population and have been shown to be effective. And psychological treatments are in fact the first line of treatment for more mild or mild to moderate um, perinatal mental health issues. I know it's not accessible, they're not always covered in, in Canada, but they are first line and very important treatments. And not only individual, but couples therapy, if the relationship is very strained or problematic, <clears throat> as well as group therapy, it also has tremendous data and tremendous value. And then of course, I just wanna highlight medication without going into too much detail because um, as I said before, and um, I, I'm gonna emphasize it again, that psychotropic medications, which are the psychiatric medications basically, um, especially antidepressants, all the common antidepressants that we use, the, the Zoloft and Celexa and Ciprolex and Effexor, these are some of the most common ones. They all have over 20 years of data, valuable data, data that shows that they are safe to use during pregnancy, that they are fine to use while nursing, um, and are often very, very important part of treatment. And as I mentioned before, particular for people who either don't respond to talk therapy or who are having a, um, a higher level of symptoms. Anti-anxiety medications and sleeping pills are often and other important parts of a treatment plan. And we use the sleeping pills in particular on a short term basis, but often a very key and important and often underappreciated part of the treatment plan. So um, I am going to start to wrap up and just wanted to uh, share with you some of the <clears throat> healthcare system resources that I encourage people to talk to and reach out to. And um, I know not all of these types of professionals are accessible to everybody, but if people are, people often say to me, well, where should I go? Where should I start? you know, generally starting with a family doctor, primary care provider is the first place to go and, and other healthcare providers too. And, um, and, and then the obstetrician or midwife, hospital social worker, psychiatrist, these are other people in the healthcare system who can be very, very uh, good supports. And if they can't help themselves, often should be able to point you in the right direction. And I'm happy for, I, I, for anybody to, to copy these, to hold on to these resources. I think they'll be widely available. Here's a list of resources that I often rely on and really like to share with people. Um, you can look at them on your own. Many of them are for self-help or self-guided information. Um, number six, Connects Ontario can link people to different therapists for addiction and mental health support excuse me, and um, the City of Toronto Perinatal Mental Health Resources and Information um, has a good list of the, of the programs and hospitals around uh, the GTA that have some good perinatal supports and different groups that are run by Toronto Public Health. So <clears throat> these are some of my, uh, my favorite resources. And then, of course, a bit of a shameless plug for a book that I wrote. It's geared towards, not towards the medical provider, for, for, uh, for everybody. Um, it's called When Baby Brings the Blues. And then my final shameless plug is for a new project that I'm working on, developing um, a virtual care a program. A um, little bit separate from the hospital. If you want to check it out, if we're going to be uh, launching it in the next few months, feel free to go to betterbria.com and put yourself on the wait list and, um, and just wait for the next things to come because uh, there's going to be a lot of uh, great offerings. So 
on that note, I will pause and am happy to take any questions that people may have. Thank you so much. I've been shaking my head throughout your entire talk. Um, I'm going to uh, pass the, the Q&A over to Hannah Eisenberg, um, who will um, present any questions that have come in. Thank you again. Okay. My pleasure. Hannah, it's all yours. Hi, thank you so much. Yeah, there was a lot of really, really good information and presented in such a clear way. Um, I also had a baby recently, and I can tell you it's not an easy time to become a parent. Um, so I think this will be helpful for a lot of people. So thank you so much. Um, so we have a lot of good questions for you. Um, so first of all, somebody asked if a new adoptive mom who is depressed would be classified the same and treated the same as one who gave birth. That's yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I'd say absolutely that the, the major difference is, you know, if you think back to my biopsychosocial model, is the biological factors would be less of an issue for obvious reasons, but certainly the psychological issues, the embracing a new role, um, giving up and other roles that someone's had, uh, probably the adoption process has been a challenging one, um, and the circumstances under which a person lives and their own relationships and their own. So, so yes, the treatment may not be exactly the same, so to speak, but certainly very can be diagnosed with the same diagnoses and, um, and should be treated and taken very seriously as well. Okay, thank you. Um, and then next question is, how do you handle um, bring a new sibling into the home with a young toddler. And so this also kind of ties into another question, which is any suggestions for talking to older siblings about the changes they may see in a parent. And I think, you know, it'd be helpful to talk about, you know, especially when you, you're, uh, the other sibling is a young toddler, right? And then doesn't understand these big concepts. Yeah, yeah. So um, another great question that is people often are very, very anxious about how bringing a new baby home is going to impact their child and what it's going to mean and if their child is going to feel slighted and if their child is going to feel displaced. And those are very, you know, common, very reasonable and obviously um, very big concerns that a lot of a lot of parents have, especially when they're going from one to two. Um, and there are some great books out there off the top of my head. I can't think of what they're called um, that, that, that parents can, can access to read to the toddler and that talk to the toddler about becoming a, you know, them developing a special role as a big brother, big sister, big sibling, and, um, and, and giving them some time to, you know, if the mom is comfortable looking at the belly and trying to explain in age appropriate terms what that means, or pointing to friends who may have a new baby come home. And um, it's harder to see people these days and harder to connect with other families. But if that's possible, or showing them pictures of babies, or even videos and showing them how their friends have adjusted and what it means to their friends too, even if they're really little, they, they pick these things up. And, um, you know, again, I'll couch it and say that we can prepare all we want, but, and some babies, some toddlers sail through it when their new sibling comes home. And for others, it can be a more of a rocky, a rocky transition. So even when the baby comes home, um, you know, I often suggest to new parents to still make sure they have one-on-one -on -one time with their other, other child to try to divide and conquer, especially if, it's, if they now have two kids, one can be with the older, uh, older sibling, one can be with the newborn, that they switch it around so that the baby and the other one both get one-on-one time, -on -one time and they do special things. It's often good for um, the toddler to keep their own routine going. I know sending a child to daycare these days is extremely fraught and complicated and is often a day-to-day -day decision, but the more the older child can maintain their routine and if that's going to a babysitter's or a daycare, often that can be very good. So they feel less of the, you know, their life thrown into, into mm -hmm. turmoil. And, uh, and then 
you know, and then uh, if thing, it's, it's rare that things go um, extremely dramatically wrong. And like anything, it's important to look at this as a transitional time and to realize that as a parent, as a mom, as a dad, as a um, as, as any kind of parent, bringing a new person into a di an existing dynamic is challenging. So it's also going to be challenging for a little one and allowing for an adjustment period, allowing for an adaptation period is really important because so often people say, oh, the baby's been home for a week. Everything's a disaster. This was terrible. I should never have had this baby. You know, so often in life, when we take a bit of a longer view on things, we realize that things settle. And, and, and this is one of those things that it's a time frame and it, we need to have a longer runway on our expectations and realize that this adjustment will happen, but it may happen after a bit of a rocky time. Okay, thank you. Um, I just had a weird computer <laughs> issue. Can you still see me and hear me? I yes. can, yes. yes. Okay, good. So I can't see anything on my screen is black, but I still have my questions. As long as you can <laughs> hear me, it should be okay. Um, so I'll go, I'll go on to the next one. So um, somebody asked, uh, how can grandparents best help a new couple? I think we have some grandparents joining tonight. Wonderful. That's a great question. And I would say the very best way to start is to ask. Um, and, I, and on both sides, you know, I, I'm usually seeing the, the, the new parents, so either the, um, and, and not the grandparents as much, but I think best to have as many transparent conversations as possible. And I encourage people, you know, write a list of what you're going to need, write a list of what groceries you want, write a list of, you know, what needs to be cleaned or what you would really appreciate help with and be super clear and super transparent about it because it's often a very emotional time for families and can lead to strife and lead to conflict. And the more people talk about things openly and honestly, and the more, you know, uh, at new parents are, are clear with the type of help they want and the type of help they need. And the more um, grandparents in this case can be flexible and adapt to what the new parents are, are asking for, even if it's not exactly what they might have hoped and imagined. Again, I always say to people, see it as a transition time, like the new mom is home and she may be in so much discomfort and pain and figuring things out and, um, and, you know, from breastfeeding to healing from, from a C-section or a vaginal, there's a lot going on for everybody. So the more people can have sort of some compassion and kindness and clarity in their communication, that usually works the best. Um, and for people to, uh, to, to, uh, to really share their expectations, uh, honestly. And that, that goes same too with new parents. Sometimes they don't want people around for right at the beginning and respecting those boundaries and expect, um, respecting those limits is also a super important thing, but offering as well. And I see it on both sides, especially a lot of new moms have trouble asking for help. So if you know you're, daughter, daughter-in-law is one of those people who can't ask, offering or saying, okay, you know what, I'm at the grocery store, I am going to pick some things up, so tell me what you need specifically, or, you know, I am right outside your house, I am dropping this off, or I'm going to come and clean your bathroom, or I'm going to <laughs> do whatever, if, you know, offer and, um, and put it out there in a concrete way, and because I, I always say to, to patients too, it's like there's one time in life people really want to be helpful to a new parent and it actually makes them feel good too to be helpful. So it's a mitzvah all around <laughs> to uh, allow other people to help you at this stage of life, even if it's not comfortable for you to ask for help. Um, so. Yeah, all good tips. Definitely the, you know, coming to clean and cook and all of that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure is, is very helpful. Um, sorry if I was looking off the side a little bit. I was trying to connect on no that. No But didn't work, but it's okay. <laughs> all right. So um, our next question. Um, so you kind of touched on this a little bit with the um, perfectionism. Um, so you mentioned that being a perfectionist can be a risk factor. Um, mm -hmm. So you know, how do you deal with, you know, when you have somebody who's a perfectionist, they can also be very good at perpetuating the illusion that everything's fine and they don't want to say that anything's wrong. Um, so how can you approach that um, without, you know, 
saying something that's going to make it worse. Yeah. So are you, do you mean how can someone approach that? Um, how can I as a psychiatrist or how can I one... Sorry, sorry. I think it was um, coming from the perspective of if you're a family member or a friend and you think that okay. someone might be suffering, but they, you know, aren't going to admit it, sort of. Right, right. You know, I, I think normalizing, starting by normalizing how hard it is to be a new parent and starting by talking about what their expectations are, because I can't tell you how many people will come and they'll say, you know, I, I had planned while I was on that leave, I'm going to write a book, I'm going to start a business, I'm going to, you know, clean my house top to bottom every day. And pretty quickly, people realize that's not going to happen, especially not in the first month or six or eight weeks. And, you know, most of the time, 99% of the time, even longer. So acknowledging how hard it is and acknowledging that none of us can ever do everything at any point in life. And it's really important to triage some of the things we can do. So thinking about, okay, what are the most important things I need to get done today? And instead of comparing yourself as a new mom to comparing yourself as before you were a new parent and all the things you could get done in a day, like work and cook and clean and work out. And none of that is going to happen when you're a new mom, especially an early new mom in the early in the few months. So you can't compare how you were before to how you are now. And it's really important, you know, sometimes it's easier for me to say that than a friend or a spouse to say that, but people have to um, basically triage what they can and need to do and write a list almost. If people are list makers, it's a great time to say, okay, all I want to accomplish today is if I shower and if I brush my teeth, Great. That's what I'm going to do. Instead of thinking I'm going to cook, I'm going to clean, I'm going to do all of these things. If you can get one thing done on your list a day, or one thing done a week, depending on how much the person is struggling or how needy their baby is or what their other issues are, you know, being realistic is, is, is so important and shifting expectations. Um, I always say to people like what I think the most successful new parents are those who are the most flexible and those who realize, okay, this isn't working for me or certain personality traits or certain ways of doing things aren't working for me well. How can I change that? Or people thought, okay, my baby was going to be like this and my life was going to be like this. And then none of it happens postpartum. Maybe some of it does, maybe, maybe all of it does, but in most cases, much of it doesn't you know, adjusting to what the reality in front of you is on a given moment and a given day and focusing on that. So listen, I, I, I preach, I don't always do what I say, but I think having that mindset of flexibility to what the needs of the moment are, whether it's the baby or taking a shower and really saying, okay, there's a cutoff line here. I can only do this much in a certain day. And, and again, having a long view. Someone is not going to be in the early um, postpartum days for the rest of their lives. Because so often people will say, I, I can't do this. How am I ever going to live like this again? How am I ever going to accomplish anything again? How am I ever going to get back to work? How am I ever, you know, let's not say always and never because those words set people up for even more anxiety. So we try and just focus in on, okay, what can you do today? What do you need to do today? And sometimes that brings a lot of relief to people to say, okay, I can step back and I can just take little tiny bites out of my day and proceed from there. Yeah, thank you. Those are some really good, um, really good tips. Thanks for the thorough answer. Um, yeah, we actually have another question from the audience um, that's a little bit related just to this perfectionist idea um, that's, you know, really, really speaks to me also of, you know, how do new moms now deal with the pressures coming from social media? We're all on Instagram and we see, you know, the perfect moms who always have the perfect, you know, house and are always doing, um, you know, the sensory activities with their babies and everything. Um, so yeah. I don't know if you had any, if you were wondering if any suggestions about that. Yeah, my first suggestion is log off. <laughs> that's a great question. Um, my it, no it, it's hard for people to log off completely but it's some people that's the only thing they can do so in some cases if it is so distressing for people and they're comparing themselves and they're finding themselves it's really getting to them 
they have to take a break, a social media break, because it can be really devastating for people. And they'll say, you know, why does she look like she has it all together? And, Mm -hmm. you know, she's lost all her weight and her house is perfect and the baby's perfect. And, and it's, it, it can be so distressing and disturbing for people. And then of course, you know, we have to remember people put their best lives out there. Like no one, you know, some people are starting to put a more realistic picture of, you know, sitting with their breasts hanging out and a breast pump on one and a baby on the other and, you know, a mess all around them. That's not the majority of people, but people curate what they want everyone else to see. Um, so it's really important to take all of that with a grain of salt. Those people don't exist in real life. And if they do exist, maybe they exist for the, you know, five minutes that they're staging the photo and taking the photo and repeatedly taking the photo to make it perfect. So, so bringing a bit of a lens of, of the reality of social media to it, um, is super important. And then, you know, as I said before, and it, it may sound funny, but logging off is sometimes the best thing for people. And if people don't like to see images, then, you know, starting a chat group or just going on an all chat, no image group, because sometimes that's helpful, or creating a chat with like minded people or, um, you know, trying to trying to reach out to friends who they think are going to be, you know, give them the straight goods on how it feels as opposed to a sort of curated manicured view of things like find the people and, and follow the people or look to the people and connect with the people who you feel are real and who you feel are, are, are not going to make you feel worse. And that's true on social media. And it's also true in real life. Um, because some pe- for some people, it's really hard to now, and for, for, you know, for better or for worse, there aren't really too many new moms groups going on in person. But that would be one thing that moms, especially those struggling with depression and anxiety, go to groups and they think, I don't relate to anyone. Everyone looks like they know how to breastfeed so easily and they all look good and they all seem so happy and they've made it here on time and their kid isn't puking everywhere. And what am I doing wrong? I can't do any of this. And then it makes them feel worse. So really important in any setting, figure out what's going to make you feel good and what's going to make you feel bad on any given day and limit some of the bad interactions. And then maybe try again if you're starting to feel better. But, you know, especially when people feel very vulnerable, especially if people are really struggling, limiting those inputs that are not healthy is really important. Thank you. That's a really, really good answer. Um, and yeah, very and practical. And thank you. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you, Hannah. And thank you, Dr. Jellicoe. Unfortunately, we have only um, a few more minutes. And unfortunately, we're not able to answer everyone's questions, but perhaps uh, they could be answered at another time. Um, many of you are familiar with Jewish Family and Child Services. Um, What you may not be familiar with is that uh, they actually run some programs for new parents and um, grandparents. And while Dr. Delphin has told us quite a bit about um, some wonderful resources, I'm going to leave it to Sharon Feldman from Jewish Family and Child Services to tell you about some of the amazing programs that they offer right here in the city of Toronto. Welcome, Sharon. Thanks so much, Pam. Um, Yep, so I'll just, uh, I'm happy to actually be um, offering information about what our center offers, but I'll give you a bit about Jewish Family and Child. Um, The organization supports healthy development of individuals, children, families, communities, through prevention, protection, counseling, education, and advocacy services. It's a multi-service agency that's been providing support to our community for more than 150 years. And the agency provides a range of services, including more than 35 types of programs and initiatives, including the Family Resource Center, which I oversee. Family Resource Center first opened its doors in the fall of 2000 based on the expression of the community that they needed a place for young families and new parents in our community to play with their babies and young children and a place to meet and socialize with other young families and members of the community. We've continued to respond to the changing and emerging needs of the community for over 20 years. Up until the pandemic started, the FRC had been offering daily family drop-in programs, five days a week, 12 months a year, 
In addition to um, family drop-in, we also offer support and parenting programs for parents and caregivers, a conversation cafe for newcomers to practice their English skills, a homework club for uh, school-aged children, and a clothing bank for women and children from across the GTA, essentially creating a true neighborhood hub and a vital community service. The FRC contributes to, to strengthening families by providing parents and caregivers with trainings in resiliency skills, positive discipline programs, literacy support, developmental screenings, and referrals to early intervention where needed. Since March of 2020, we've continued to host daily interactive circle times online for parents with babies and toddlers and preschoolers. We've grown as a community through our private Facebook group and have offered new and innovative ways to stay connected while apart. One example of an online social program we piloted last year was our Parent Cafe, which was a weekly virtual drop-in for parents to chat about the stresses and struggles of parenting in an effort to help reduce isolation and forge peer support. So the Family Resource Center is truly a unique place in our community. Um, I welcome any new families who'd like to join us. You have our, uh, my email address in the chat, and I look forward to seeing you there. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. Um, many of the resources that both um, Dr. Delphin and Sharon uh, have just presented will be sent to all participants tomorrow, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a minute. So I want to thank Sharon. For, and Sarah for joining us tonight. And of course, a very big thank you to Dr. Ariel Dalfin. Your insights and your very sage advice was, uh, was most appreciative. Um, your talk this evening really has been so informative and really so reassuring. Um, it's very comforting, I think, for new parents and their parents, and I, I talk as a grandmother as well, um, to know and to hear that new parents are not alone when they're feeling that, that when they have feelings that aren't aligned with expectations. Um, yes, there are many ups and downs to bringing baby home, but there, and there are lots of joys and oys, <laughs> but um, you have really reminded us that um, many of their feelings are quite typical and likely exacerbated by the events of the last two very atypical years. Um, you know, I think, you know, reminding us that being better informed, um, having good support, looking after oneself and seeking out the proper resources available will enable many parents to better navigate their way through really what can be a very difficult period. And I wanted to just end with something that you say in your book, which is by doing those things, you will have given your partner, your family, and of course your new baby, the best reward of all, a happier, healthier you. So we thank you, first of all, Dr. Dalfin and um, the Luke Sklar Mental Health Initiative Committee and the Women of Holy Blossom have purchased two of the books that you recommended. Of course, the first one is your book, When, when Baby Brings the Blues, Solutions for Postpartum Depression. And another one that you recommended, which is The Postpartum Husband, Practical Solutions for Living with Postpartum Depression by Karen Kleiman. And both books we have um, dedicated in your honor um, and will be placed in our beautiful library at Holy Blossom Temple in the Luke's Law Mental Health Initiative section, which of course is dedicated to topics of mental health and wellness as well. We have made a donation to our initiative in your honor. And we want to thank you again for your generosity of time and for your incredible expertise. To all of you who have been joining us tonight or will join us later um, in, in the recording, we are very much, we very much appreciate your participation and all of your contributions to the Luke Sklar Mental Health Initiative. This fund allows us to educate and support the community, particularly in the area of mental health. All participants will be receiving probably tomorrow by email a complete list of resources that Dr. Delphin has shared. And um, 
as well as resources on many of the areas covered this evening and those covered by Sharon as well. We trust that you will find these helpful and valuable. Please feel free to share them with anyone who may be in need. As well, these resources will be accompanied by a very, very short survey, which we ask that you please complete and return to us. We really want to hear from all of you. We want to continue our great programming, and we are always looking for ways to do better. So we welcome all your comments. And finally, on behalf of the Luke Sklar Mental Health Initiative and the Women of Holy Blossom, we bid you all a good night, and we wish you all good health. Thank you for joining us this evening. Shalom. Lahitra'ot. Good night. <laughs>